Hello everyone. Welcome to the very first Tweedy Talk. This is your regular host, Tweedy Gamer. I hope you have been enjoying the content on the channel so far. I know that I've been enjoying putting it together and planning it. I realize there's been a bit of a delay with how long it's been since the last video. I believe it was the um, Tweedy Tale, uh, The Blood of the Beast, which for the moment, considering the just the overwhelming response that Bloodborne has received, critically, uh, artistically, and everything creatively, it's it's been um, it's been every every bit the reception it deserved, and and that I uh, to a to a very great extent I had a lot of faith in the project from the start, and to an ex to a very great extent it was the reception that I expected. And even uh, and even exceeded. There were some some great um, some great review scores and some great words said about the game. Uh, I feel as though it it really um, it really uh, is a testament to From Software that they that they they knocked it out of the park with um, with Bloodborne in terms of just the sheer amount of effort and the scope of Bloodborne the. The, the universe I've been playing it uh, on and off. I'm in the, I'm sort of currently borrowing a PS4 to and fro. Um, his he's my friend who has the PS4 is playing Dying Light and I play uh, Bloodborne when I can. And um, it what it does it it sort of parallels what happened earlier in in sort of our lives with the '90s where it would literally be his turn, your turn, etc. And it would add that extra. Uh, that extra extra element of can't wait to play and Bloodborne is exactly that kind of game. You just can't wait to play it. You can't wait to, um, you know, spend a bit of time grinding away, getting more blood vials, uh, so that you can, um, sorry, blood echoes, so that you can channel them into new skills, um, and uh, you know, without spoiling anything, with with just improving your character and um and giving those incredibly tough and harrowing bosses yet another go um i'm it for my first um miyazaki game that i've actually played i've read a lot about it but for my first miyazaki game an incredibly familiar yet incredibly challenging and and sometimes quite you know punishing experience which again it, it i revel in that challenge and i've been reveling in that uh, that emotional roller coaster with my earphones on at night. It's been, it's been quite the um, nostalgic trip to games that did that for me, uh, including Medieval, as I discussed uh, during one of the uh, Tweety casts. And it's just been, uh, yeah, it's hard to quantify because I'm still in the in the in the middle of playing it, still in the middle of discovering it. I haven't, I've been um, watching myself online to make sure I haven't spoiled any of the plot. I'm pretty early into the game, um, that is to say, and don't laugh anyone, I'm sure you will, but nevertheless, I haven't actually beaten the Cleric Beast yet, who I believe is one of the first few bosses, um, and obviously one that has been showcased in the trailers, and um, nothing of a spoiler there. So, but anyway, without further ado, let's um, let's move on to the main content of this Tweety Talk. We're going to um, try and get to roughly um, an hour and a half or so for this talk, um, and I have a few things that I want to discuss. Uh, I attempted to do a Tweedy cast, uh, sorry, a Tweedy talk um, on the move um, from work uh, during that commute, but it was, um, yeah, it was, it was an experiment, and it didn't go very well. Too much background noise. Um, so for now, it's going to be sticking with the at-home microphone, which will, um, it won't be long before I upgrade uh, my equipment to have something that has more noise cancellation and better uh, sound quality. I'm looking at upgrading a computer soon so that I'll be able to put through videos faster with um, the program I'm using it tends to freeze up and slow down. So uh, those are those are in in the pipeline now. But in the meantime, producing what I can when I can, and um, thanking you all for your uh, continued interest and your subscriptions and your um, and your investment in this channel because it's very um, validating for me and it it, uh, it motivates me to keep uh, putting out this um, Tweedy content, uh, you know, um, Tweedy lens on the interactive medium. Launching off from that, which is, I guess, just reaffirming what this channel is about for anyone who hasn't heard any Tweedy 
Gamer content and is listening for the first time, Tweedy Gamer is a scholarly lens on the interactive medium. We basically here um, look at games from a pretty different lens to the majority of the industry, where there are quite deservedly um, a great focus on the metrics and on the um, you know the grossing, how, how much games make and how well they uh, review. And we discuss a bit of that here. Uh, and then gameplay is um, is a great focus for a lot of websites um, out there. But for Tweedy Gamer, what we um, tend to sort of hone in on here, just naturally, it's um, it's an aspect of games which is getting more and more um, investment uh, from the developer point of view. People uh, putting more time and care into crafting background stories, crafting historical references and cultural inspirations, and even um, you know fitting philosoph philosophy in there in, in these games, and and you know commentary on the human condition, and um, you know uh, with this um, new generation, especially where we're moving into more photorealistic territory, we're moving into higher production values with um, visual presentation, audio presentation. It's opening up uh, the uh, creative avenues and the, the nuanced uh, creative avenues that is heretofore unseen outside of you know award-winning Oscar-winning films, um, Grammy award-winning uh, you know music and Emmy award-winning TV. It's it's uh, we have had a few games recently that had um, um, creatives of this caliber uh, working on the projects. We had Austin Wintry who was nominated for a Grammy who did the um, Journey soundtrack. We had Kirk Ellis, who uh, did the, H the Emmy Award winning HBO series John Adams, who did the script for The Order, which is, cannot fault that script, phenomenal script. Um, the game uh, was very, very narrative focused and very linear, and, it, and it, um, it sort of rubbed a few people the wrong way with the medium that it chose to tell its story. I, I consider it a 10 out of 10 game for what it is, for what it. Um, uh, you know, committed itself to be, and it never promised to be anything else other than something brand new, and so it shouldn't be judged unfairly because of that. Um, but these, um, these, this, this level of quality, this level of unprecedented um, activity in this in the interactive medium, um, has given, uh, has given, has prompted a, a channel like Tweedy Gamer to finally take shape, a tangible shape. It's sort of basically been um, my. Uh, my own lens as a person into the medium. I've come from a, uh, you know, a um, a background of of um, growing up with games and and even to an extent learning the English language from them. <laughs> Final Fantasy and Metal Gear Solid taught me a lot of my vocabulary when I was uh, younger. You know, growing up in Italy, and uh, they became invaluable for me. And so I have a quite quite a relate close relationship with the medium. I drifted away from it um, in sort of the. Uh, late 90s to mid 2000s. In the late 2000s, I started uh, hearing rumblings of um, multiple projects which looked to be, uh, including the Bioshock, which I believe was a 2007 game, um, which uh, was the earnest beginning of a new, um, you know, new period of interest for me in the medium. And it's only been building year after year since. Uh, I'll actually be discussing a few of the games that, or the you know interactive titles that I am looking forward to the most in this Tweety Talk. Um, the way that Tweety Talks work, as you could probably tell in the intro video if you've seen the channel trailer, rather, is that um, with these uh, videos, I basically take a very informal, very conversational. Um, a stance. Uh, the Tweety casts are more focused, and they're generally three parters or you know four parters, um, even more. Uh, should um, you know, should I find that uh, a, a project you know needs more than three parts, I'm I'm probably going to be doing several. Um, but for uh, things like Tweety talks and um, uh, and also Tweety tales. Um, there's there's a whole different uh, array of of content that I've got planned, and uh, everything has its own flavor. And for two D talks, it's um, informal discussion. Which after completing uh, the discussion after however long, I kind of pick what was the main topic that I found myself honing in on naturally and discussing. Uh, usually, topics that um, have to do with uh, at least 
pause and um, deal with a few of the journalistic um, and recent happenings uh, that aspect of games, which I'll be discussing a few of um, with this. And there's been some great and, and really uh, inspiring and intriguing announcements that have been made with the with on IGN and um, sort of in the industry about a few titles, which I'm pretty excited to talk to you about. And um, and yeah, so um, a few, very few. I'll just do a, a few um, channel updates for the Tweedy Tale, uh, Blood of the Beast. Um, I'm going to be putting that unless I get um, you know some feedback about wanting to continue it, sort of immediately. Um, putting that on a hold for a little bit. I'll obviously be completing it for my own sort of sense of completionism. Is completionism? Uh, it's something that I want to be able to look back on and, and have in a sort of uh, watchable and um, you know almost like an, uh, a visual uh, um, multimedia storybook. I'm looking forward to putting that together. Um, but in terms of prioritizing content, I I recognized. Um, that staying relevant, staying quite, um, you know, I, I am, I naturally am, um, usually have my fingers on the pulse of what's happening with the industry daily. I, I check all the outlets and, and I keep myself informed. And um, I also develop my own uh, personal curiosities and interests, which I focus on. And for this week, I'm sure you've been able to tell by the um, thumbnail with Goro, is going to be Mortal Kombat X the game that is coming out in, I believe, roughly 10 days. Uh, the franchise that stretches back into the 90s, which is chiefly where I was the most receptive to games, and so has a, um, I would say, outright nostalgic, and that's it. Uh, although there are some aspects where, for me, especially uh, with the nature of the game being as violent as it was obviously uh, created a bit of friction with um, how often I was able to play and, and what I was allowed to be exposed to uh, at that age where I wasn't able to make um, you know my own decisions with that kind of thing which is fair enough and I completely understand with my parents and um, and when it came to being allowing myself to be exposed to a game like that and there's going to be a bit of storytelling later about my relationship with them um, with Mortal Kombat through the years, and what my relationship is it is with it now, and what it what seems to be um, most of the world's uh, relationship with it now, which to kind of bullet point it, I believe from the nineties, it's gone from um, very controversial, very um, fringe, and, and quite risque, to um, it's much much more accepted. First of all, obviously the culture of Mortal Kombat and the references like in The Simpsons, for example, with Bonestorm, you could tell that Mortal Kombat to an extent permeated the mainstream with the general public's awareness of it. Um, and so there was always that aspect where uh, it was known for what it was, this ultra-violent game, which the creators still maintain, was simply a stylistic choice which there was no agenda of, or of, of wanting to be... Uh, you know, wanting to be ultra violent for any kind of you know, uh, you know, excessively controversial you know, purpose. They they weren't they weren't like particularly angry or or dangerous people. They just it just sort of fell into place when they were developing it early. Uh, what's a way that we can make an impression? What's a way that we can sort of stand out? And over the years, I believe it would have to be close to twenty uh, years that that um, Mortal Kombat has been around, of course, probably even more. Um, it has gone from that one very controversial, very risque and, dang you know, strange and dangerous and um, title that many parents were had nightmares about their children playing and being exposed to, this sort of um, very taboo... Uh, especially early on in the 90s, very taboo game, going from that into something where I just, before starting this podcast, uh, um, this Tweedy talk, I was watching, I had just hiding my room, and I was listening to the three la um, latest combat casts, cast with the K, over at the Mortal Kombat community. I'll put a link to their um, channel in the description. Um, it was... It's a complete, so going from, as I said, the 90s to what this thing was, uh, you know, 
um, huddles of teenagers around these boxes in the arcade and drawing these looks and hearing these you know um, yells and screams and laughter of joy and gross and reactions uh, going from being incredibly you know grossed out to being incredibly entertained and laughing and then anger and you know which is I mean I was there you know I was on the street there experiencing that I still have very very visceral memories of of um, Mortal Kombat and, and the sort of role that it had. It always had that kind of air of just forbiddenness about it, and um, that was definitely taken into account with um, the Simpsons parody, Bone Storm, which is, it, it played entirely on that paradigm at the time of young boys, uh, particularly young boys, I'll just say, um, wanting to play that game and then, uh, you know, having to face the fact that not only was it incredibly violent and confronting for very impressionable young minds, uh, it was, you know, it sold out everywhere, because, you know, um, there were people like, in the episode, for example, it plays on the fact that there was a very rich kid who wanted to have two copies, and Milhouse got a copy, and the the notion of it being unavailable was, was very unavailable for controversial reasons, and unav- unavailable for popularity reasons, that was definitely... Uh, um, portrayed in the Simpsons episode, and it was definitely the case for me. Um, I find my, I found myself relating to that quite a lot. But basically, going from what Mortal Kombat was to what it is now, with these, I've got to say, very jo- jovial, very friendly, very community. It's called the Mortal Kombat community. The channel. Um, look, the fatalities are just are, are no far more more visceral, more bone you know, bone shivering, spine chilling rather, spine shiveringly awful and gross and like delectably gross and exquisitely disgusting and terrifying and violent. Just as no, more than more than they've ever been, obviously due to the photorealism and the production quality increases and the what they can do with the the PS four and the Xbox One's architecture to realise Mortal Kombat, um, what Mortal Kombat has always been, which is that, like, phenomenally violent and phenomenally, like, wickedly enjoyable uh, game that blows open the, the walls of reality, goes so far, goes so over the top as to now, for me, to ask me personally, it not being something that I can find uh, earnestly, you know, Having as 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 having because it's so over the top, it goes so far into sty- over stylized and um, photo real though it may be, but so far that it just it just doesn't have the effect of being you know what sometimes GTA can do, which GTA can sometimes portray very accurate um, you know portrayals of violence, but with Mortal Kombat the emphasis has always been over the top, like sickeningly entertainingly over-the-top violence, which, you know, Conan O'Brien did with the uh, Super Bowl recently, which gives a perfect example of how uh, it's permeated now. It's found its place 20 years later. Even now, there is a place for Mortal Kombat, and even more than just a place. Um, We're looking at a time now where there are, um, as was done recently, the gorolives.com five-hour Twitch stream, which I'm going to be watching. I can't wait to watch it. Uh, I've got it preloaded now. I'm going to be watching right after I finish this Tweety Talk, which I saw a few glimpses of yesterday while I was um, enjoying the long weekend here in Australia. It was just, it was just a, a, a great, a, a great thing um, and very eye-opening to see just how organized and just how um, uh, event-esque the whole thing thing felt. I mean, I um, I turned to my girlfriend and I, I basically said, doesn't this sort of feel like, almost like the Olympics, almost like, uh, you know, Eurovision or something. It just has that, that, that feel where everything is made into an event, you know, the hashtags, you know, hashtag punch walk. I found myself Googling hashtag punch walk because Goro is definitely um, the peak of why I am looking forward to um, Mortal Kombat X, um, the lore, how, how it plays on both um, um, you know, Japanese Shinto and also 
uh, Taoist and Buddhist uh, um, you know references to, to culture and, and to even deities and, and certain figures and, and, and story arcs and, um, and narrative components between Mortal Kombat and um, these real world myths and real world uh, religions it um the parallels are there and uh it's it's incredibly intriguing to 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 be actually fully leaping into that 20 years later after this um franchise has had so long to develop its own culture so long to develop its own lore and history and and mythology and many i'm sure again as i said during the bloodborne broadcast there are many people i'm sure who uh just it's not it's not a priority for them to put it gently it's just they don't really care about um, those deeper aspects to games but Tweety Gamer is all about taking these games which uh, not just these games which you know aren't clearly um, angled towards that the scholarly aspects and the scholarly lens um, those are very uh, you know those those pro those games such as Bloodborne and Mortal Kombat um, which don't offer uh, an immediate, uh, unlike things like Journey and Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, which do very obviously sort of prompt and lead you uh, into wanting to discuss these um, uh, these games as you know games as art and uh, you know in a more noticeable and in a more easy to uh, talk about um, uh, without needing to explain. Because I find, you know, in a much easier way, able to contribute these titles to the discussion of advancing the interactive medium. I don't expect anyone to come away from this uh, Tweedy talk um, with the, uh, you know, with the belief that Mortal Kombat is a cultural, <laughs> you know, in in the way that in the way that um, people um, would seriously. Uh, take uh, the mythological and the religious and the thematic aspects of um, of Mortal Kombat um, to uh, to realize um, to realize their detail uh, as as Nether Realm have has served to enhance the narrative of the games. It has taken a life all of its own with its comics and the and the lore and and how extensive the the you know the Mortal Kombat timeline I've been reading through that on my walks to work, it's absolutely like very detailed and very um, very intricate, but clearly obviously having only had twenty years versus hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of the the religions on which it's based, just as a matter of just as a simple matter of time, it, it can't really measure up in terms of detail in terms of scope to. Um, um, to obviously the, the the real religions and to the to the real, you know, the inspirations which you know, uh, Mortal Kombat took those real world sources. Um, D Mortal Kombat definitely, definitely, I believe, I genuinely believe has acted as a sort of entryway for people to then you know in this internet age where we're just clicking between links to go to the um, Mortal Kombat section on. I believe it's called cultural inspirations or possibly contributing cultural material, I think, which I was, I was ecstatic to find that there was a section like this, um, that someone felt that the, uh, that the universe, that the mythos of Mortal Kombat deserved a section that, that was this dedicated to, uh, it's the substance and, and to the real world inspirations and, and, and touchstones of the lore and to the, and to the design of the characters, you know, Seeing what, like for example, with Ra Raiden and with Goro, uh, and um, and Kintaro and uh, Kung Lao, and explaining all these names and and what they mean, and it's just it's it it basically adds a little spice to uh, to something where before the age of the internet, it would just be a name. It would just be a name in a booklet, in a Sega cartridge, you know, um, box. Uh, and now that um, we do live in this era where we can just click from link to link and be able to say, look, I, I, I spent an hour reading about Shinto um, deities thanks to Mortal Kombat. It's something that even back when it was at the height of its popularity, I don't believe it, it could ever have had as pervasive an impact um, as, it, as, it, as it's been able to have with the internet age 
one of the reasons I decided to uh, re-pre-order it, because at one point I had pre-ordered, cancelled, and I actually jumped back onto my pre-order, was the first 25 minutes uh, that I think IGN posted of the Mortal Kombat X, um, the game, and just watching that intro and just, just seeing how much, like, how much the, the production quality and the clear, very obvious amount of hard work and passion has gone into fully fleshing out this, um, this universe of characters, this, this, um, this timeline, uh, the, the, narr- the narration, which I think is done by Johnny Cage, in the in the video speaks of um Shinnok and speaks of the thunder god Raiden and and their struggles and their confrontations and and just basically catches newcomers to Mortal Kombat uh catches them up to the first 3 um the stories of the first 3 including 9 I believe 9 told the story of the first 3 and it tells the first 3 plus 9 story and um, alludes to, or rather, uh, catches everyone up to where things begin at the start of Mortal Kombat X, which has also been supplemented by an excellent, an absolutely excellent um, comic series, which I've been um, following and listening to the recaps of, uh, which have been fantastic. And I'll 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 put a link to the YouTuber whose name I've forgotten, uh, which is sacrilegious because I've been watching his content all day, uh, um, a fellow, um, a fellow, you know, interactive medium YouTube broadcaster, I'll just say, um, fantastic recaps, and very amusing recaps, rather, uh, of the, um, of the Mortal Kombat X comic series, which I, I was enjoying so much earlier today, watching, um, uh, and listening to the introduction, essentially, of Kotal Khan, who I think was a, an amazingly designed character, uh, it, and as I suspected before reading the comic that the Aztec influence was present, it actually is alluded to in the lore uh, in the comic that uh, Kotal Khan um, was, uh, I, I believe he comes from Outworld, but he was uh, either banished to or sent to Earthrealm. Uh, where he was absorbed into Aztec culture. He sort of wandered the planet until he found Aztec culture, and because of his powers, because of his um, appearance, and because of uh, his presence, he was he went on to become a leader, and he taught them, taught the Aztecs how to fight in the way of his kind. And, um, and there's a great relationship there with his father, um, which I'm looking forward to finding out more about. I've really, honestly, had my... my mind blown open uh, about um, when it's come to the the lore of the Mortal Kombat series. I've, I've, I don't know if it's something that speaks to my appreciation for the efforts of the underdog, but the impression I'm getting is that there is a f- incredibly passionate community out there for Mortal Kombat who are the furthest thing from what popular culture term and pit uh Mortal Kombat fans to be like, uh, as in the, you know, the be- uh, neck bearding, very skinny, white, all overweight, uh, acne ridden, you know, I think we've gotten far, far past that, but if there are any lingering stereotypes of the kind of um, people who gravitate to these games um, and gravitate to things like specifically Mortal Kombat, where there had been for a long time, this is prior to these times where things like the Big Bang Theory are, top-rated TV, Game of Thrones has... I was watching the episode guide of Game of Thrones on the HBO official channel, which is essentially an incredibly well-produced and well-made wikia for the Game of Thrones uh, universe and its history and the, uh, the timeline and the characters and the houses... Uh, and the events, and the map, and the geography, all of that within a HBO viewer's guide, the same channel who did Breaking Bad, and basically I'm saying that Mortal Kombat has, and geek slash nerd culture, which I think those terms, you know, they have completely had a 180 in terms of their, uh, how people respond to that term, and there's actually much, much more of a 
oh, what much more is an understatement, an incredible amount of pride and, and belonging that is associated now with geek and nerd culture. Uh, that did not used to be there. They used to be quite derogatory terms, but now they're seen as affirmatives. They're seen as um, very. They're seen as as um, titles of pride among people, and I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, especially owing to how connected everyone is, and how, um, and how internet and commu computer use across all demographics of people has just shot up, and now computers are just. If you can believe this, and I, I would have everyone now listening uh, remember when just the word computer used to be very, very nerdy, very, very geeky. People used to pick on people who used computers very often. Now, and you can all fact check this, just turn to your, uh, you know, if you find yourself discussing this podcast later with a friend or a family member, just ask them, when was it the last time that the word computer made you think made you think of someone who was nerdy or geeky computers are now like telephones they are like toasters now they're in such common use that they're a means to an end we don't have there's there's very little stigma associated with the computer itself obviously there's still going to be some stigma associated with computer games and you know interactive games um you know on console and such and the word game itself still carries a bit of um uh, carries a bit of uh, stigma. I think it was Max Scovel on an IGN podcast recently that said, uh, and I, I I might see if I can find the exact quote, but he basically said that the interactive medium struggles already with being associated with its sort of adolescent, immature, you know, past uh, that now with things like um, I think we live in a post-console warfare age, especially with what's happening with with Nintendo. Which uh, I mean, there's every there's every sign that there's a big shifting of the tides happening with Nintendo, who once swore that they would never uh, develop their um, games for any other platform. Now, obviously, with the um, DNA merger, or I think one the companies bought stocks into each other and they're going to collaborate on iOS games for Nintendo. Um, it's my belief that the Nintendo NX will be something of a uh, an archive slash next next gen uh, machine. By archive I mean that there will be a huge virtual console component which will allow you to play essentially all, almost all, of Nintendo's previous consoles games in a virtual console environment, which I'm incredibly excited about, and it will definitely reinvigorate interest in Nintendo, which has waned, it's an objective fact, uh, with the reception of the Wii U, um, leading up into uh, The Legend of Zelda Wii U, which I myself am looking forward to. I won't be getting a Wii U just to buy it, um, I'll be playing it on uh, a friend or a family member's Wii U. Definitely looking forward to it and to doing content, 2D gamer content for that. But um, basically, all I'm saying uh, with all these um, sort of uh, touch points, these bullet points about where video games stand now and where things like, I guess what's what I'm saying is what's happening to Mortal Kombat, uh, the change that's happened in the perception, the popular perception of Mortal Kombat, is a symptom of the broader change of the world's perspective on video games and on the interactive medium. It's one of the reasons why Tweety Gamer has come about and why, I, why I've stepped out uh, of all of these thoughts and these um, uh, opinions and this, this lens that I've had, uh, feeling like it has a place out there, which you guys have definitely proven and, and for the for a time, I think there was about 60 of you who had subscribed. I'm not sure how many there are now. I, I'm, I'm just stepping into doing this now after I've posted it. I'll definitely be checking. But for all of you who have um, taken notice and who respond to and find a kinship with this content and with this perspective and, and believe in games as much as I do and, and believe in uh, the potential of the medium as much as I do and, and how how exciting it is and how revolutionary the medium promises to be uh, leading um, uh, itself to. You know, I, I think now the industry, 
this medium is just doing its thing. It's it knows exactly what it's doing. I don't think, uh, with the, the, with a few exceptions, um, there are some there are some signs of needing to learn from its mistakes and needing to learn from its limitations, which uh, the order eighteen eighty seven. Uh, I think will show us with um, a better balance between gameplay and giving agency to the character and the cinematics. Um, I'm really looking forward to what Ready at Dawn um, do uh, after this and what I believe is the inevitable sequel. Um, I, I'm, I'm obviously checking, I'm checking them every day and seeing um, if if they've they've begun talking about it. Obviously, the game I last I heard it had sold about seven million copies. Um, I think it was in a comparison article with Bloodborne saying that Bloodborne reached 7 million in 4 or 5 days uh, in the same in the, in, the, in the amount of time that the order took a month to do. I think it was something like that. I might see if I can find that link and put it in the description as well to that article. But, um, but yeah, so uh, that sort of ties up um, sort of that that angle there. I touched on some of the Nintendo stuff, which I'll be expanding on in uh, another Tweety talk. Uh, sorry, another Tweety cast. Which the one that I'm referring to, there's going to be another. Uh, I referred to it in the introductory video. Um, it was called the Tweety Pitches. So uh, by a Tweety pitch, I guess I'll use this opportunity to uh, introduce this notion. Is um, essentially. They'll be much briefer than these Tweety Talks and Tweety Casts, but a Tweety Pitch is going to be a pretty, a relatively well-realized pitch, essentially, for uh, for a, a either an aspect of a game or for a game itself, unto itself, um, that I will be just happily putting together. There's this, this uh, outlet that I've created with Tweety Gamer, um, to be able to finally put these together and, and get some opinions on them. And one of them, I'll just say as a bit of a taster, uh, is a game based on um, uh, a band, but not in the way of rock band, in the way of a photorealistic third-person uh, music-esque simulator, where, for example, it would be um, a sort of the experience of knowing or being around or being the members of a certain band during certain eras. A couple of bands that come to mind are Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, and for more recently Mast the Mastodon, and uh, Metallica, and uh, and others, you know. And and the idea would be, uh, this is a, a very, very small uh, version of what I'll be expanding on later on a d dedicated um, uh, Tweety pitch. Uh, the idea is that... Um, uh, you take this band through their career um, chronologically, as you, as you tend to do when you read a band's Wikipedia article. You follow the band from when they joined, from when they met each other, um, to their first few record deals and to their live performances. And each each part would have an interactive aspect, and it's uh, something I'm yeah looking forward to to putting um, putting together the the full pitch for, and uh, that'll probably be the next one. But um, but moving on, another thing I wanted to touch on uh, in terms of recent content I've sort of had my eye on, uh, Pillars of Eternity by Obsidian. I, ta I just missed the Kickstarter, uh, however many months ago. I think it would have, have to have been almost a year ago that the Kickstarter went up for Pillars of Eternity. I just missed it. I jumped on within a few weeks of the Kickstarter ending, um, as a as basically someone who, you know, I bought the I think the eighty dollar boxed edition, the old school nineties uh, boxed edition, which I can't wait till it arrives. I've checked into my account recently, and it's says that it's shipping. Um, can't wait for it to arrive. It's I'm very very pleased to say that it has been receiving a fantastic reception uh, from IGN. I think it got a 9.0. Uh, that, um, for Bloodborne, by the way, it was a 9.1. So, uh, Pills of Eternity, 9.0. Every bit the game that people were hoping it would be, that deep, rich, um, incredibly well-written. It was said, it, actually, in the IGN review that the, um, the game was a few novels 
lengths long in terms of the amount of text and storytelling because it essentially um, replaces cutscenes with text and um, and well-drawn pictures, you know, which I've seen some of in the reviews and in some of the gameplay. Um, I will be playing on a Mac and I may see, because of how, um, you know, because of how I make all my content from my computer and, you know, uh, my microphone, that there may be a possibility of me doing a Let's Play uh, or a Twitch, as they say. I'm not sure how it works. Again, I'm just stepping into it after a while. But um, I would be very, very keen to to start a game and, and sort of experience that um, uh, and, and do something which I didn't have the chance to do in the 90s, uh, both due to, you know, not being able to play the game uh, since my, I think, the game I'm referring to obviously is Baldur's Gate, which ha Pills of Eternity has drawn a lot of comparisons to. Um, I wasn't able to play because I, I was the younger brother and uh, my sister played it more often than me and I, I wasn't able to play simply because I was the, little, the smaller brother. So this will be really good, great opportunity. That's something actually that, taking it back to Mortal Kombat, I'm really looking forward to. Uh, stepping into Mortal Kombat in this era now, where this game and this community and this, this, uh, um, the universe of Mortal Kombat, the how it's portrayed now in this incredibly well detailed photorealistic, photorealistic way, in this incredibly socially connected way, it's, it's much more in tune with, uh, with basically who I am. I, I, I never liked the idea of, in fact. Speaking a bit about my childhood relationship with Mortal Kombat, I remember buying, I think it was a PlayStation compilation of um, the first two or three games and feeling so guilty f uh, after bringing it home, you know, spending my own money, but bringing it home to my father, I felt so guilty that I think I either destroyed it, I actually probably broke the game or threw it out a window or something, or I brought it back to the store. I can't remember which, but it was something like that. And um, again, my relationship with games was uh, was not entirely my own. Um, I ha they were around the house, and and for for the amount of time that I spent with them, they were I became very close with them, and they in many ways supplemented uh, what for many people at that time in their lives um, would have been the main influences and the main thing around the house. Who knows, it may have been films for them, for other people, television, and certainly literature. Um, there are many things that, from, for example, games like Final Fantasy, um, with their very existential protagonists and very complex plots and their, uh, their narrative arcs, which in some cases uh, parallel uh, well-established ones from literature. There's uh, a heavy suggestion that... Um, the Final Fantasy XV, at least in some aspects, will include a few Shakespearean references. I think there was a Shakespeare quote in the last, the last last Final Fantasy XV trailer, um, and it doesn't really come to me now. I wish I could remember it. I'll probably pop it on the screen now uh, if I end up creating this um, Tweety Talk with visuals on YouTube. Um, there, there, that was basically my relationship with games. Is is um, I played the ones I was allowed to. I took from what, I took from them what I could, and um, and for what I wasn't allowed to play, uh, I may have wanted to play them and uh, and occasionally, you know, asked to play them and sometimes played them without asking and then subsequently feeling bad. Um, it basically it was. It was very tied into my childhood, very tied into and everything that comes with being a child, which, uh, which um, is restriction and um, your parents being concerned justifiably for your development and for how impressionable kids are. Uh, it's something that I, I absolutely now, at the age of 26, 27 this year, can perfectly understand. Um, something that obviously with the passage of time 
takes a bit of time to to understand and I may seem like a bit of an old fogey for saying this but I can appreciate uh, when a parent doesn't want their child to see um, violent content however however more acceptable quote unquote it is in this era compared to the stigmas of the past um, there are certainly parents who if they were in the 90s the sort of um, the time when the likes of Ma Marilyn Manson, they were seen as like heavily controversial uh, to the point where parents, many parents were since like honestly, earnestly worried about their kids and their children's um, uh, mental and emotional health and their psychological well-being well with being exposed to this material, which had so much more of a taboo around it. People were so much less informed and had so many less avenues of finding out the truth uh, to these, um, to these, uh, you know, aspects like these, um, aspects of the popular culture, where now you can just go on YouTube, you can go, uh, do a Google image search to be able to see the man out of makeup, research all his inspirations, research all his interviews, find out about the man, watch his interviews, find out that he's far from, uh, you know, I consciously, um, demonic and strange, like, like, violent, like, on purpose, wanting to incite violent behavior, and suicidal behavior, he's far from that, as, as he's proven many times, he's an artist, and he, he maintains that, uh, his craft is um, chiefly to, um, challenge norms, and to challenge, uh, preconceptions, and, um, to expand people's uh, tolerances for, um, different uh, for what is different, for what is taboo, and for people to make up their own judgments instead of um, following uh, the status quo and for following um, uh, what is basically presented and going past that and, and making up your own mind and thinking for yourself, essentially. Um, that is something that uh, this modern era of, um, you know, connectivity and, uh, you know, to different sources of information and the amount of journalism now has skyrocketed uh, with with this uh, this new paradigm of of delivery of information and and being able to uh, research and absorb information with all the how tos and with all the you can really really just become a an information nomad and just properly inform yourself uh, and and go beyond all the main outlets. It's something that television stations are they're they're noticeably struggling with. Um, and the internet is is the reason why, you know, tying it back to Mortal Kombat. Um, it's the it's the reason why this this game has now become something almost like by building on what it was in the nineties, of course, but now become something almost completely different. It is uh, it is <laughs> in many ways much more celebrated and much more enjoyed and much more. Uh, it it has entertained more and more people because more people have become aware of it. And if uh, we're looking at outlets like Conan, um, with his Super Bowl special, where with two um, the two athletes playing the game, and even with the dismemberment and disembowelment and the and the violence, there's this there's the, it is people are starting to get that this is for schlock. It is for entertainment. It is. And even the creators recently did an article with um, IGN where they basically say, look, we know what barriers not to cross. Our emphasis has always just been on, you know, in terms of using the fatalities as an example, rubbing it in. It's it's a way of an incredibly over-the-top way, which can be in many ways quite cathartic to just rub it in, to to make something that even though there's things like Super Smash Bros, which are addictive, they are... Um, you know they're they're enjoyable they're they're great party games, but with Mortal Kombat there's just that extra amount of visceral enjoyment you can get from them. And for me, Goro Prince Goro absolutely represents that. Um, if you can believe it, on top of doing all my errands today and tidying my room and and preparing for this um, Tweety Cast, uh, one of the things I was doing was just. I was googling Goro, <laughs> just looking up this character, and uh, and I was I was pleasantly um, reminded of how in the Simpsons episode 
of Bornstorm. Uh, Bonestorm, rather. Sometimes my vowels just take a vacation. It's a side effect of having learned English as a second language. Bornstorm. Yeah. Um, but basically, yeah, Bonestorm, um, in the small amount of gameplay, quote-unquote, that you get to see Bart seeing uh, as part of the commercial, and, you know, in whatever, whatever scene that you see the game being played, um, there are essentially two hyper-stylized um, Shokan warriors, which is what Goro's race is, the half-man, half-dragon, uh, fighting each other, and um, and for me, Goro represents just as the as you can see in the latest trailer, just pure brutality. Just, ugh, it's just I can't wait. That's why I've pre-ordered it. In in a, uh, in in from one point of view, there's many more, obviously, which I'll be going into um, with the remaining. Um, gosh, we'll put we'll put an, another forty to fifty minutes in this one here if we can. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I basically, um, I looked into, um, Goro, including looking at his, uh, you know, the history of the, of, of what sort of, uh, led to his creation and what led to his character design and, and how he once was originally going to have a longer name and he was, uh, the story of his tribe was going to be a bit more, uh, you know, about, I think personal vengeance. The original plot was that he wanted to restore honor to his race, something like that. But I, what I, I'm much happier with um, where he eventually ended up, which added a lot to his um, the menace of of Goro and just the foreboding of just that name, how short it is and how menacing. It's just Goro. You can tell that gore and violence and death await with a name like that. You know. And uh, hence why I've basically made him the thumbnail, made him the kind of the, uh, incorporated his name in the title of the podcast, um, the Tweety Talk. And um, it's just what I find is um, with this channel and my relationship with games now is when I'm, I mean, by and large, and I've said it before uh, with this channel, when you speak, when I'm speaking on this channel, it's a one-to-one um, uh sort of a one-to-one um, impression of what it's like to speak to me in person and, and what my views are, I tend to, uh, you know, articulate my thoughts in a in a certain way here just to make them as clear, just for all of you guys and for myself too, to be able to um, uh, cogently and, and with lucidity uh, express my thoughts um, for the purpose of having a useful and... Um, and uh, uh, you know, well-made Tweety cast so that I can I can look back and say, well, that wasn't just sort of squeeing and wasn't just uh, wasn't just sort of um, glorified, um, um, you know, over excitement over over something. But one thing uh, that I found myself with this is because I am looking at these games um, uh, in in some ways like Bloodborne. It was in some ways unexpectedly. I I was not expecting to be taking to these game games, as as I'll call them. Now, obviously, nothing's a game game, because everything has this amazing production quality, and, and every every game, unto itself, to an extent, uh, is a feat of artistic merit and, um, and creative merit. But, um, you know, I... And I don't... I, I've sort of made a commitment with Treaty Gamer not to swear on the channel, but I am very, very excited and very, very happy about... Um, um, playing Mortal Kombat very soon and, and playing it with some friends which I haven't done in a while and it is incredibly uh, I'm incredibly gratifying to know that you know coming into this period of adulthood and independence for me that I'm able to basically buy my first Mortal Kombat game without feeling guilty uh, you know I, uh, having done all my errands and looked after all of my other um, more important um, life priorities, um, all of that, and to be able to set aside a bit of time to just, I guess, genuinely get into the spirit of, of just having fun and honing my reflexes and sort of um, taking a well-deserved break from working hard. Um, it's something that um, it's, it's sort of made an, a little bit of an unexpected but a very, very pleasant return to my life. And, and um, even though this may just all sound like, you know, the sky is blue, very obvious, uh, information to people who, who are listening who have been long-time gamers and they're they're very well um they're very well very familiar with with what's great about games and, and why we play them but 
if my sort of re uh, my reemergence into playing games and sort of um, my experiences have uh, you know sort of served to remind you that um, to sort of pause and, and um, not take for granted the fact that this great medium very enjoyable very unique and and um, very just immersive unprecedented um, sort of peerlessly immersive and and enjoyable in in ways that in in such uh, visceral ways and in such kinetic ways that uh, film and television uh, as as absolutely gripping and as funny and as stomach like side splittingly funny and and uh, you know spine chillingly frightening and everything that that games and films sorry films and television can be uh for me games uh they're they're going one beyond they with how i with how they're able to synthesize um uh everything that we enjoy about t v and and film and music uh into this uh, amazing package which I still believe even if the 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 medium's been around for over twenty thirty years, I feel like saying I hope I haven't gotten that wrong um it's to me in many ways it's only just begun speaking of which um what's coming up soon uh which are there'll be definitely some Tweety gamer content coming you know ramping up towards the beginning of um uh, towards the beginning of uh, E three in a few months' time, um, I've committed myself to doing a dedicated uh, Tweedy talk about sort of orbiting around um, Battlefront, Star Wars Battlefront, which I think I mentioned in the very first Tweedy Gamer video, where it was just me sitting in front of the couch. Um, um, I'm looking forward to that. I'll just speak a little bit about um, the. Uh, the video filmed aspect um, we're going to be testing out pretty soon I think in a, a week or so uh, when my friend's going to be available um, he'll introduce himself however he wants to if he if he decides to but it's my friend who I've been borrowing the PS4 off of who is a big Mass Effect aficionado um, who I will be getting on the couch and talking with uh, about um, his he's been recently showing me a lot of the last of us content which i've despite you know the whole gist of uh tweedy gamer and and my own lens into the interactive medium um i've sort of sort of left by the wayside i haven't as investigated as much as things like bloodborne and mortal Kombat. possibly it's something to do with me not wanting to go towards the most obvious uh of um of games which I think have already got a lot of content and a lot of commentary and um, uh, that discuss their artistic and sort of I guess as a shorthand their deeper merits and their more uh, their meritorious aspects let's just say intellectually meritorious um, and artistically I, I think um, The Last of Us has a lot of it covered I mean it's being it's been essentially the flag that's been waved for the interactive medium, signaling that it has transcended its adolescent, you know, childish, you know, childhood um, beginnings. Uh, I find myself saying now that I've I've completely fallen in love with The Last of Us. I think it's a phenomenal game, and I can't wait to see what they do with the film and, and everything. But I find my just myself just when I'm watching last of us content and showing it to people i just find myself saying the words we have come a very long way from mario a very long way from banjo and kazooie and crash bandicoot uh, it's just something that just something that you know looking at some of the incredible content they've made uh in terms you know naughty dog the guy's uh, who made The Last of Us, putting out those documentaries and the One Night Live performance. Gosh, that uh, performance art rendition of The Last of Us was just amazing and so moving and in such a small span of time and, and, and in many ways, you know, all credit to the man, but Neil Druckmann, by coming out in a, his very directorial style, uh, you know, between the performances... I'm not sure if you've seen it. If you haven't, 
little spoiler alert for what I'm talking about. Just go la 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 for the next ten seconds. But basically, um, by him coming out and uh, sort of between the vignettes and sort of giving direct, you know, sort of breaking the vibe and and talking more as a director than as a, uh, you know, getting into the mood of it and just saying, oh, that was great, that wasn't great, you know. Uh, by doing that, uh, I feel like um, a bit of the vibe was uh, sort of. It was, it was a bit different. I thought it was going to be more sort of one continuous performance, but it was nevertheless amazing. It didn't take away from just beholding that team and appreciating that team, including the the composer and all the actors and for what they've accomplished. And all of them have, uh, uh, I, I believe they're going to move on to uh, amazing stuff. And we will be looking back at them um, in the future of the medium as uh, a team, a very important team, a very important time for the medium um, t- uh, in its maturation, you know, and, it, and in its increase in the potential for nuance and, uh, you know, exploring the human condition and, and for emotional and thought- thought-provoking and sort of humanity-engaging content, you know. So that's been amazing as well. But um, look, I'll say it, the focus of this Tweety Talk, which I'm, I think I might be wrapping it up now. It looks like we're getting a bit of a thunderstorm, so I want to make all my preparations for that, including turning a few appliances off and all that um, here in um, here in Australia. But um, but yeah, I, I I'll I'll tie this one off as um, basically being my incredibly excited about Mortal Kombat 10. Very very excited for upcoming uh, E3, which is a few months away, granted, but um, um, Battlefront which is premiering at Anaheim, absolutely can't wait, um, and uh, and also obviously when we're sliding into May next month, The Witcher, which I'm going to be doing quite a few Tweety talks about, I dare say, including the customary Tweety cast um, for the main titles that this channel has sort of committed itself to exploring uh, the Tweety aspects of. So, But anyway, um, thank you so much for listening and for your interest in this channel. Um, I apologize again for how long it had been between the last uh, video and this one, but uh, with uh, with essentially establishing the pattern and the different video formats and content formats, which is what I'm doing now in the middle of balancing out uh, sort of main life uh, work and such, it's going to be a bit, bit more structured, a bit more regular and um, and something that, as I said, from as I've been saying from the very start, this is something so Tweety Gamer is an extension of uh, two things. One, my lens on, on, on the medium, which um, in an unprecedented way in these times with the tools that we have available to ourselves as content creators, we're able to articulate and put this stuff into a format which we can, you know, it's, it's an outlet that allows us to, to articulate these thoughts and these uh, opinions and these, uh, you know, um, this material that we that we have in our heads, you know, in, that's what the pictures are that I mentioned, you know. But in terms of the whole channel and the whole output, I I, I think this this project of Tweety Gamer is two things. One, uh, about my just who I am naturally, the lens that I have, and and wanting to basically put together a compendium of my own thoughts, just to have an outlet for it because it clearly is sort of spilling out of me especially given these times number one and number two uh you know as an incidence to people who as part of how everything is so connected nowadays who do want to tune in and sort of partake and for you guys you know i i i'm i'm very 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 grateful to 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 anyone who's ever listened to a treaty gamer um video and, and to a podcast and uh, and who is looking forward to more content and and I dedicate uh, this one and obviously all my content um, to you guys uh, you know thank you so much um, till next time I've been Tweety Gamer bye now